one thing that stood out was you mentioned the name of the bank, First Savings Bank, and how they're actually like in favor of Velocity Banking. Now, most of my audience here is 28 or so plus people watching. For the thousands of subscribers that I have on YouTube, I've created tons of videos that really teaches people how to finesse and finagle and kind of work the bank to get access to a HELOC or mm -hmm. PLOC. Oftentimes they walk into the bank and they're being sold or pushed or, or encouraged to get a refinance, a traditional mortgage loan, a home equity loan instead of a line of credit, a personal loan instead of a personal line of credit. So it's like, we don't just walk in in the bank and say, hey, I want to I want a first lien HELOC, a second position HELOC, <laughs> if I can do velocity banking to pay off my debt and then leverage it to invest and acquire real estate and start a business and da, 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 da. Those are all red flags. So how is it that this particular bank, First Savings Bank, is actually in favor of velocity banking? Why is that? Let's make sense of that because isn't it, that possible? Isn't it in the interest of the banks to make the most amount of profit on us, the consumers? So that's that's our perspective from most yeah. of the viewers here of what we're used to. Uh, yeah. so this is a very, very different perspective. And we're very interested in touching on that before we get into the product of, wait a minute. No, that, that makes a lot of actually sense. Like what we do. <laughs> that, that makes a lot of sense. So now we, we do. And I can't necessarily speak. Well, I can't. The, the bank does. The way it was introduced our branch manager, my I guess my boss, his name is Roger Williams. And this is actually the third first in HELOC bank platform that he has built. Uh, and I can kind of get into why that is the case, you know, later on too. But he had a good amount of history with the product in terms of performance from a bank standpoint. And when he initially approached First Savings Bank, the person that was in charge of the mortgage department was very entrepreneurial minded. And so was open to maybe other types of products and opportunities that maybe more traditional bankers would have seen as a higher risk. And so right. he introduced the product to the bank. And I think uh, by the time that there was enough volume for the, the traditional you know bankers to notice it, it was already performing really well. And so kind of snuck in there you know, in the back door. But the cool thing is from a bank's perspective, there are two sides to it. You know, you, you hit the profitability piece. The truth is that in terms of dollars made by the bank per dollar lent at the beginning of the loan, they don't make as much. That's that's true by far because the amortized mortgage is like crazy profitable. Um, Up front. But, right. I mean, and so they incentivize that and it makes sense. And when people use this as taught, right, as we teach and, you know, as you teach as well, they're driving down their balance really quickly, which also means that they save gobs of money in interest, which means that it's gobs of money that the bank doesn't receive, right? So naturally they wouldn't like this product and that that makes sense, but that's on the profit side. I have one argument or, or one one perspective from that, from, that, uh, from that side, which is that although although the bank is doesn't make as much profit overall, in terms of dollars lent in real time, they actually make more. The reality is the rate with first and HELOCs, the interest rate is a little bit higher than mortgages. And so the reality is as you pay down your balance, every dollar that you pay back, you give back to the bank and they just go invest that money somewhere else. So with the dollars that they actually are leveraging with this product in real time, they're actually receiving a higher rate of return than they would with a mortgage if they held on to the mortgage. So th there is a little bit of an argument against that, but there's another piece that is equally or maybe more important from a bank's perspective, which is risk. And so our particular portfolio, our particular, you know, the, the customers that we bring in, we we lead with the education piece, we lead with the, the velocity banking, and we do a lot of vetting, whether it is through educators like, you know, Denzel, or whether it is us teaching about this and letting people know about it. People are using it, all of our customers use velocity banking. And so, there's a risk piece to it, which is that the reality of this of this loan is that you could use it unwisely as well because you have access to your equity and the, the risk assessors, managers, you know, uh, people at the bank, their worry is that people will use this in an irresponsible way, which will increase the balance and then you'll have a bunch of defaults. And that's possible with this loan if, if you're not responsible with it. Mm 
-hmm. And so they see that and that, and they're scared of that, right? So for most banks, what they see is a product that doesn't give them as much initial profit and is extremely high risk. And so our particular customers have proven different where they use velocity banking, which means that their loans, to, their loan to values are decreasing drastically, which the risk guys at the bank love, right? They're like, this is great. There's very little risk with this. At the same time, the profit that they make on the dollars that are lent out in real time. And because it calculates its, its interest daily, we're talking about daily interest, like in pretty much real time, they do receive a higher rate of return. So even from that standpoint, it, it can be seen as a profitable loan. One main difference is that people that we choose to market to, right? And the people that we choose to, to connect with, right? Are people that use this loan correctly, right? So our, you know, we, we know how to find a customer that is going to create a low risk first lien HELOC for the bank. And I think that's something that's a, that's a little bit different because, you know, we could lead, you know, in terms of, of the messaging for this, we could lead with, you know, hey, do you want to save money each month and only pay interest? We could lead with that. That would attract someone who really needs to, to I mean, cash flow is important, right? But that messaging would attract someone who may may have a tough time budgeting, right? And it needs to needs to save money, right? That would be the that would be someone that would not use this loan for the overall long term benefit, if that makes sense. That does. And you know, we could lead with, hey, do you want to? If are you worried about losing your job, do you want to have something where you can float on your home's equity? We could lead with that, and I could sell a bunch of those, right? But the portfolio as a whole would end up being a very risky portfolio for the bank. And then they wouldn't like the product. So I think we're in a lucky spot because we kind of hoodwink, hoodwink the bank, right? Into, mm -hmm. into introducing the product. And by the time it became something that that would have an effect or would that, that people would start paying attention to, it was actually performing really well. So I think from that perspective, we're unique as well. Got it, got it. Now, to add to that perspective, make sense of it for why this is very advantageous for the bank compared to just pushing traditional mortgage loans all the time is the way I look at it. And for example, let's say there is a, a client that has a $250,000 mortgage, 30 year, and then they have a total, the value of the property is, you know, say 750K or 600K. And let's just say they got access to, you know, $500,000 of a HELOC, right? First lien HELOC. Well, mm -hmm. First Savings Bank has now taken business from that traditional mortgage loan and now First Lien HELOC is going to hold that. So that's interest that instead of they're paying over there, they're now going to pay to First Lien, uh, First Correct. Savings Bank. Correct. Then on top of that, because the client understands the velocity banking concept, they've got personal loan, they got a car loan, they got credit card debt, they got student loans yep. at all these higher rates. And again, they're moving the debts into the first lien HELOC. And these are all interest rates that First Savings Bank now gets a piece of. Obviously, it's going to be less, right? The client is, is shifting eight, six, nine, five to say, I, I think you guys are at 4.75%. And then the reality is when we're doing velocity banking, we're manipulating that rate to an actual effective rate of maybe 3%, maybe even 2% in, in reality when they're when we're running the numbers. But still, nonetheless, all that money it goes back to First yep. Savings Bank. And it, you know, it's interesting you say that they receive less than 8% and less than 6%. But the reality is that they would never receive the 8% in the first or place. the 6% or the 9%. So although yeah. they're receiving less than 8%, they're receiving a 4.75 that they would have never received. Exactly. And then on top of that, after the client wipes out all their debt, what are they doing again? They're getting ready to leverage. So they're gonna pull yep. that money right back out and go acquire a piece of real estate. And, and that's so another big piece of it too. Perpetuating interest that the bank receives. So yep. it's a win for the bank, a win for the client, because they're getting out of debt faster and they have access to all this equity to go create wealth with. Yep, I exactly. and. Um, the, this concept is foreign to a lot of bankers too, right? So this idea of optimizing 
how an op open-ended line of credit works. That's really all this is, is you could do this, like you said, you could do this with a P-lock, right? P right? You could do it with a second lien HELOC. You could do it with a first lien HELOC. You could do it with a credit card. We're just not taught how to optimize this type of loan here. And so that's what we do, but, but the most bankers don't understand that either, right? And so that's where a lot of the pushback comes from. Your loan officers at your banks and credit unions, they, there's no incentive, there's no monetary incentive or very, very, very little monetary incentive for them to sell a first lien HELOC over a uh, traditional mortgage. You know, even from our standpoint, the comp is much lower, right? Even at our bank, right? And, and that's, that's a reality. And the thing is, I think you have to find people that are committed to this and see the value in it from a value standpoint to the customer, right? And I like to think there has to be a little bit of altruism there. I can know that's kind of counter to the bankers, but you know, you have to understand how this works and, and really value the, the opportunity that it provides for other people. But even from a bank standpoint, it does have to come down to the to the bottom line, right? And I, I give a lot of credit to, to Roger, Roger Williams. He he built this. It was his, you know, I kind of followed him over here. And he's the visionary behind it too. And so um, I've got to learn a lot from him, but also see him build this out. And, and he's created something that works for the consumer. And it's it's created with, with a lot of consumer, uh, you know, customer sort of um, features that, that are created for the customer with a portfolio that also works for the bank that the bank really, really likes. So I, I don't know, but my understanding is that it's one of the best or the highest performing assets that our bank has which is counter to what every other bank thinks about this product. Exactly. So, so it's it's really, it's neat to see that there's a way to make it work. It's just, um, you have to have a product that appeals to customers and you have to find the right person to build the portfolio uh, to make sure that they use it in a way that, that it doesn't put the bank at risk. Right. So, um, so with that being said, what I want to do now, I want to start diving into the, the nitty gritty details uh, in terms of the the process, the requirements, the eligibility, the terms on yep. how my audience now, 40 plus people or so watching, if they're yep. in a position financially, they're actually looking at obtaining a first lien HELOC. So I'm just specifically focusing on people who would qualify for this or are in the position to obtain a first lien Absolutely. HELOC. Let's, let's go through the details of your specific first lien product and you know what sets sure. that apart from really every yeah, other. Yeah, it sounds great. It sounds great. So do you want to talk about the, do you want to talk, should we get into guidelines in, in terms first, or do you want to talk about the general progression and what it starts and to finish piece? What would you like, what would make sense to start with? Let's start with the, um, the general terms requirements, uh, sure. eligibility, just like the, the different stats of the, the product itself. Yeah, Let's start absolutely. there. So our particular first in HELOC is a 10 year draw period with a 20 year repayment. What that means is that it functions as a HELOC, as an open-ended line of credit for 10 years. And at the end of 10 years, any remaining balance that you have converts into a 20 year fixed rate mortgage. And so what that means is, you know, an amortized mortgage that facilitates the pay down over the next 20 years. So if you follow that progression, your loan is paid off after that next 20. It also means there's no balloon payment. Um, so a lot of times HELOCs will have a 10 year draw with a balloon payment or some other option after that. Yeah, the, I guess we can, the rate itself, um, the rate is a, it's a variable rate product. Um, and the way that mortgages, uh, you know, um, adjustable rate mortgages, as well as adjustable rate HELOCs, the way that they usually calculate their, their interest uh, for you know for the product is it uses a base index and it adds a margin to it. So the one that the example people are used to hearing is you know prime plus one. So what that means is yeah you look at the index the prime index right and you add one point to it uh, to calculate your rate. Uh, our I guess algorithm is we use the six month T bill six month Treasury bill plus four point five. So what we do is you know we look at the six month Treasury bills through the bond market. Uh, the United States Treasury bond market. And we just add four and a half to it, so that's how that's that's how it's calculated. Gotcha. So the, what is what is the expected <clears throat> rate that average client should get approved for in 2022, knowing that the rate could change? But in 2022, as we record this video, what is the expected rate uh, I, I can 
you know, spectrum. so I don't necessarily know about that, but what I can speak to is the, the work or the research that I've done to try and or better understand gabber. how the, yeah, how the T-bill works. Right. So, so right now we're at about, you mentioned four, 4.75, well, right now we're at about 5%. So the six month T-bill is at about 0.5%. So if we do the math, you take 4.5 plus five, uh, four and a half, right? Which gives us around 5%. Mm -hmm. um, I, I do know that the feds have announced that they plan on increasing rates a couple of times. Yeah. Um, and the, the feds are the ones who are going to be in control of your bond rates. And so, I do, do, I do know they've said that. What what I've done is to look at what this rate would have done uh, from 2010 until COVID, because right after 2010 we were in a recession, uh, or just just getting out of out of a recession, kind of like we are now. And so I looked at that uh, for the next nine, basically the next 10 years. So from 2010 until 2019, as the economy grew, the six month T bill increased. Uh, it capped at about seven uh, and then dip so uh, what i usually do when i when i project rates using a calculator that we that we use to to kind of run scenarios i usually just use a rate of 5.75 or six percent that's a, an attempt to try and be conservative and realistic with the rate so right now we're at five percent i would say over the next year maybe an average of 5.125 maybe 5.25 percent something like that okay so we can expect that rate to pop probably go up a little bit more like you said you can i one, five, i would five. um my i i don't have a master's in finance i'm not a stockbroker but from what i understand you know bond rates generally increase in line with the strength of the economy so mm -hmm. as the economy gets better i would anticipate the rate getting higher um, and we talk about that too right we we run a lot of scenarios a lot of exercises with people Got it. So, so they can see how important is the rate, right? Is it something we need to fear a whole lot or is it not? And so, uh, you know, the reality is this isn't a mortgage. The best way for me to think about it is it's not necessarily fair for us to assume that factors that affect mortgage, that affect mortgages a certain way are going to affect it this way as well. So now let's go into cost. What does it Perfect. cost for me to obtain this type of product through first sale? Yeah. So I think a lot of people hear HELOC right? And they expect that they think of an additional line of credit on top of an existing mortgage, right? That'd be your second lien HELOC. The reality is this is a different, this isn't that, right? The transaction is different even. So this transaction is actually a first lien mortgage or product that pays off your current mortgage or first lien HELOC, right? Or your, your first mortgage. Um, it replaces your so mortgage. Got it. It replaces your mortgage, right? So it's, it's actually equivalent. The transaction is equivalent to a, a refi. Right. So in terms of the work that has to be done, right, it's the same as a refi. So the line items cost wise are going to be the same. Uh, however, it is substantially less expensive than a full out conventional or FHA refi. So th there's usually four, about four buckets of, of fees that I sort of think about. There's the bank fees. You've got appraisal, you've got title and then you've got state fees. So the only bank fee is a flat fourteen ninety five origination fee. So one thousand four hundred ninety five. Okay. So, yeah. The appraisal is usually about $450, uh, $500, depending on the market and, and uh, at that time. So the uh, so that's the appraisal fee. The um, What was the appraisal fee? About $450, $500. Got it. Title fees and state fees. Th those are a little bit harder for me to hard quote uh, because they are straight third-party fees. And they tend to fluctuate based on where you live and price point uh, title fees consist of usually you know you're going to have a, a closing fee you'll there'll be title insurance and then there'll also be some, like a title search or something like that and then the what is the, the what would be the rank so that you've seen um, on average doesn't have to be accurate maybe eight hundred dollars to a thousand dollars okay so what what i've done to be honest to to avoid trying to quote <laughs> title fees and state fees is we took an average of all the loans that we've done, all the first thing HELOCs that we've done. And I, I did this because I wanted to give people something, right? Um, and again, I, I, because people want to have a, some semblance of how much it's going to cost, right? So, uh, you know, we've got the bank fee that we know, the appraisal fee, um, the average fee for all the loans that we've done, then that includes bank fee, appraisal fee, title and state fees ends up being right about $3,500 total. Okay, what the was the only, state fee? 
average? So, so state fees, so all states are going to have a recording fee. That's anywhere from $85 to $300 to record with the state. There are some states that have what's called a transfer tax. And this is why this is more difficult because a, a transfer tax is a tax that's, that's placed on any real estate transaction, including refinances. So just to give you an idea of, of the, how much it, it changes, it swings like New York state, their transfer tax on real estate transactions is like $10,000. It's bonkers. Florida, right, is is second and they're about 3,000, right? Tennessee is, you know, $800. Georgia is, you know, $300. And then there are a lot of states that just don't have it. So that's a really big swing, right? So it, depending on the state that you're in, that can affect it a lot. So what I wanted to do, again, the, the average $3,500, the reason why I say that is because I want to give people something when they ask realistic um, expectation right right um you know and so you know if you're in an expensive state it's going to be higher than that right if you have a nine hundred thousand dollar loan right it's going to be more expensive than that but generally speaking that that's about you know what i what i quote in terms of the average just because i don't want to completely push the question aside because it's a valid question at the same time i want to be realistic with the fact that mm -hmm. there are certain third-party fees that i i can't I don't know how to quote without having the information at hand. Got it. Yeah, not, no problem at all. But this is this is good info. Before we go any further, what I also want to do is draw a line and say, who is this not for? Because this product is definitely not for everyone. I can tell right off the bat. But let's kind of identify why you wouldn't want to get this particular debt tool, maybe something else, right? Mm -hmm. Starting with the simple fact does this bank do business in all 50 states or are we limited you know kind of break that down for us yep so right now we can do first lien helocs in all states except for texas for maryland hawaii and alaska Got texas it. has funny heloc laws maryland well funny isn't the right word but a little bit different right maryland has a law rule that says that you have to have a brick and mortar in their state to be able to do loans in their state even with right. federal loans. and then alaska and hawaii they just kind of they're the unlucky two that because they're not in the 48 continental i guess it's just harder for you know to to support collateral that kind of stuff so yeah uh, those are the states we can't do um our minimum draw amount is a hundred thousand so we can go to 90 percent, which means that in terms of the valuation of the house i would put that at about one hundred and twelve thousand. You're, you're, you're talking about LTV, right? How much? Yep. So, it acts so at 90%. Correct. So yeah, good point. Thank you. So we can go to 90% LTV up to a line amount of 750. Being the max. Being the max line amount. Correct. Which equates to about an $833,000 valuation. Yeah. Now we can go to 80%. LTV up to a million dollars, and then we can go to 70% up to 1.5. Most people are in that 90% range, if that Got makes it. sense. Does the rate so, change the higher we go? No, no, it's a standardized rate calculation. So okay. that's one thing that's different about this particular product is that we didn't use what, what's called risk-based pricing. So a lot of times when you hear about things like that, where the line amount goes up and the rate goes up, right? or you're, you have a lower credit score and the rate goes up, or you have a better credit score for the rate going down, mm -hmm. that's called risk-based pricing. So basically with the additional risk that comes with certain scenarios, yeah. they increase the interest rate. That isn't how ours works here. Um, ours is strictly a, a six month T-bill plus 4.5 for everyone that qualifies for the loan. So coming back to who is this not for, let's say I have been doing velocity banking on my mortgage with a, second position home equity line of credit at a rate below five percent simple mm -hmm. interest and i've paid off more than 50 percent of my first lien mortgage mm -hmm. in your opinion would it would it still make sense to potentially look at replacing that with a first lien heloc or do you guys you know, provide that transparency where you try to look at the numbers and like, hey, there, there's really not much interest here to save. 
you're, you're better off kind of just sticking to where you're at. Is there ever conversations like that? Because I know I constantly have that conversation with my clients as well, where I'm like, hey, um, your mortgage is at a 1.9%. <laughs> I don't even think it's worth paying the thing off. I think we should go invest, you know? Yeah, yeah. Do you guys so, have that kind of conversation? We do, we do. And we dig into the numbers. And I think that, you know, when I compare first lean HELOC to second lean HELOC velocity banking strategies, right? In terms of overall performance, they're, they're pretty comparable, right? Yeah. I mean, one doesn't crush the other one. So from a number standpoint, you know, for instance, if someone is at a 50% LTV or they've paid off half of their first position mortgage and they have a second lien HELOC, the question I ask is what are the goals? What are your goals, right? If the goal is strictly to save money and pay off your house and you're okay with managing a second lien HELOC velocity banking strategy, then the first position, uh, the first lien HELOC doesn't offer that much value to that person, right? Yeah. Um, you know, I, I do think about the difference between the two one main one is that it, you know if you well there there are two really that kind of come to mind one has to do with management the other one has to do with leverage uh and the amounts that you can leverage so the reality is with a second lien heloc you are always limited to the initial amount of draw that you were provided at the beginning of your heloc so you know if you're given a hundred thousand dollars if you pay down your first position mortgage by three hundred thousand you still can only access one hundred thousand with your you know, a total of a max of $100,000 line from your second lien HELOC because it doesn't increase as you pay down your mortgage's balance. That's one way that a first is different, which is that if you, the more that you pay down your first lien HELOC's balance, the more you have access to, to leverage, which means you can leverage more safely if you choose to with, you know, leaving a cushion there. So, so that's one main difference. So, you know, if, if people really want to, to tap into more and more equity, I would make the argument that getting a first in HELOC would be more advantageous just because as you pay down your balance, you open up your line of credit more and more and more and more. Um, so that, that's one you know argument. And then the other piece comes to man, comes down to management, day-to-day -day use, right? The reality is that when you get a second lien HELOC, you, you add another vehicle to the myriad of vehicles that you already have, right? Got Which it. means you have another vehicle to, to use and manage, right? As compared to the first, where the first when people use it in this way to optimize how it works, it actually consolidates, you know, a number of financial vehicles that you have all into one sort of financial hub. So again, the, the numbers have to make sense and they have to work out. And if you're going to lose money, right, with the first thing HELOC, it doesn't always make sense. The funny thing is I talked with someone a couple of weeks ago, it surprised me, but the qualitative features of the HELOC were worth taking a hit on his bottom line just because he was able to simplify his life, right? So, um, okay. and so you bring that's up a usually good point. not how it goes, right? That's not how it goes usually, right? Because this is a financial tool yeah. and we're, we're talking about bottom, bottom line, but yeah. Um, but to be honest, my, my communication or tone for him, when I talked with him was more of one of, this doesn't make sense, right? And, and I wasn't trying to steer him away from it. I'm not in like the loan prevention department, right? That's not, that's not my job. At the same time, I do believe that there's a, you know, with this product, there's a, there's a higher ethical responsibility to help people see what I see, right? And if it doesn't make sense, we need to let them know, right? Yeah. Um, so I, I actually was testing you on that a little bit because we can't just say that, you know, Velocity Bank is the best way to do it. Um, oftentimes I'll, I'll work with clients that forget to run the numbers. And so they just think that, oh, just because I'm doing velocity banking, I'm, I'm gonna go faster. And that's not always the case. Especially, oh, especially when you're trying to decide which debt weapon, which debt tool uh, am I looking to obtain for myself? So if yeah. I'm looking at, you know, okay, first savings bank, okay, 5%, and I already have a personal line of credit or, or a second lien HELOC at 3%, 4%, and I have a, big equity line, because I have clients that have PLOCs for like 50, 70K. I have um, clients that have second lien HELOCs for like 170,000 being like the max I've seen so far. So there's some pretty decent sized second lien HELOCs at two and a half, three and a half, four percent under under this rate of uh, five. Right. And so they're like, oh, well, should I just you know, replace the whole thing? And I look at their numbers, I'm like, well, 
you've got this 3% HELOC in the second position, your mortgage is at two and a half, and that's mm -hmm. the only debt you have left, and you've paid more than 50% of the first lien mortgage off, either A, get the first lien HELOC at a convenience to simplify the life, that would, you can make sense of that, or B, don't pay the property off, and let's go leverage that second lien HELOC and invest to create some cash flow. So there's different conversations that can be had there. And I like the fact that you're willing to provide that transparency and say, no, we're, we're gonna actually look at your numbers first and see if this thing even makes any sense. But, like, what if all your debts are below 5%? You know, does yeah. it make sense to, you know what Well, I mean? and you know, even, even when we, even when I work and we work with people who are well-versed in the HELOC, and in, in, in velocity banking and they know their numbers. Yeah. I sort of force the conversation of, can we run your numbers? And I try and do it tactfully, right? In a way that, that people are okay with doing it, right? But that is a very, very important piece to this too, because there have been enough people that I've worked with and run into where they get really excited about the strategy. Yeah. And it, it's something to be excited about. It's true, it's awesome, right? But they see it. And the assumption is that because the strategy is awesome, it's going to work for me. And the truth is that's not always the case. And usually it it works out where it does. Um, and uh, the debt consolidation piece can make a huge difference too, because it can free up cash flow to make it perform better. But there have been people where we've run their numbers and you know it's kind of quiet. And I sort of say, you know, it, my my go-to line is, do you know of another? Uh, home loan that can do this, right? And if they're slotted to pay off their home in 19 years and pay an equivalent rate of, you know, 5.65% in terms of, a, you know, comparing with a 30 year fixed rate mortgage, if their answer is, yeah, I know of a lot of loans that can beat this, like my answer is I do too, right? Which means it doesn't make sense to, to do. And, and that's an important thing to name, you know, for, for everyone, everyone involved from, from the customer standpoint to, me knowing that I'm helping, actually helping people, right? Uh -huh. um, to the bank side, right? Because, um, and so all in all, it's it comes with a what I believe to be a, a, a to, to work with this product in a way that is gonna be successful. You have to be willing to look at the hard truth and name the hard truth when it doesn't work. Help people understand why, right? right. Help them plan and, you know, if it's something that they're committed to doing, help them find a way to to end up being successful with it in the long run. But if it doesn't work now, we have to name that. Got it. So next is, let's say I am in a position, I don't have a line of credit yet. I know my numbers, got good cash flow. I got mortgage, I've got you know other debts, and I'm looking at the first lien HELOC. But then I come across another product called the all-in-one loan, okay? Mm -hmm. And the all-in-one loan, is very similar to a first lien HELOC. It's a checking account, it's a line of credit, and it's the loan all in one. Yep. Now, how can I come to a conclusion of this or that? Like which one would make more sense? You know, we've gone through the main points of a first lien HELOC. And by the way, for those who are watching right now, catching the replay, I do have a segment in the manifesto in the course that goes over all in one loans. And there are some there are some content on the YouTube channel, public videos that go over all in one loan product, what that is, how that works, and the different um, features and benefits to that. Now, just from your perspective, let's say you got a client that com comes to you and say, hey, uh, you know, I'm, I'm deciding between all in one loan or first lien HELOC. Uh, how, how can I make that decision? You know, is it going to be based off of the rate, right? Because if that's the case, all-in-one loan is doing a lower rate. Last time I right. checked, they're, yes. are, they're around 3.75%. Last time I checked. So I just tell them, don't, don't do the all-in-one. Just come with, come with a... <laughs> <don't worry. laughs> um, so, um, and I, I do joke about that. I, I, you know, I think that having fun and connecting with people is important too. But, but all that being said, um, you know, our rate's higher right now. When I think the last time I checked theirs, ours was also at 4.75. So I think, it, you I'm know, pretty sure they went up. When it, 
I, I think they did too. So I would imagine we're probably a point above theirs, right? A point, yeah, that's um, safe. That's safe, right? about a point higher. Um, and you know, if with the way that amortized mortgages work, that is a huge, huge deal. That's a reality. And I think that that is a, a, a one selling point um, for them that they have. That being said, one thing I do know about their product, I'm not sure how well known this is, is they, they have mortgage insurance with their product, which is an additional fee each month that you pay, which digs into your cost. We don't have that. And so although our rates higher, got it. I would make the argument that the the lack of mortgage insurance negates the cost that comes with a higher rate. Okay, um, so, so slow that down. So all in one loan has a required mortgage insurance. If you're gonna go, I wanna say between 80 and 90% loan to value, yes, they do. Got it. Versus first lien HELOC does not require and insurance in fact whatever your existing homeowner insurance is you just continue to keep paying that correct so yeah so first savings bank we do not have mortgage insurance on a 90 percent loan to value first in heloc so but the client so I, they'll carry their own homeowner's insurance or am i getting confused there ah, ah good 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 question i may have used the wrong term so homeowner's insurance is going to be you have to have has yeah, insurance, insurance right, right, right. right? Mortgage insurance is a little bit different. So um, you have to get mortgage insurance on all FHA loans, right? Mm -hmm. And it's an additional- uh, It's an additional insurance on top of the insurance that I already have, <laughs> correct? Right, because, because the mortgage insurance, what that covers is the risk that comes from the bank leveraging more than they're comfortable with. So does that make sense? So in order, you know, I don't, uh, I don't know the history, but my assumption is that before you could put 5% down, you had to put 20% down on homes, right? 20% is sort of the bread and butter amount to put down for banks. I am assuming they didn't have mortgage insurance before that. Now with mortgage insurance, now that it's a thing, what they do is they, they insure, you know, and it's all if, if the borrower defaults, right? Um, they insure the amount that's borrowed from 80% up until 95, right? Because the bank is leveraging more than they want to uh, or more than they're comfortable with. So they insure the amount that is higher than the, the risk threshold that, that they would be comfortable with without it. So um, so basically the all-in-one loan requires mortgage insurance, MI, yeah. Um, and we don't. And so, you know, th there are different ways of structuring a loan to appeal to, to the consumer, right? Yeah. The main one is the main one is is rate, right? And, and I understand that. Um, but when we break it down, we what I focus on a lot of times is cost, right? What's the cost? Correct. Well, you know, our rate is higher, which means it results in a higher cost. But if you have a lower rate with mortgage insurance, right? I would make the argument that it sort of negates that the lower rate because now you have to have a higher cost that comes with it. So that's one one. Difference. Sometimes you um, have to bill the cost, you have to build the cost into your rate when you, in a way. Have, when you have a consistent cost, such as mortgage insurance. When we're dealing with origination fee, appraisal fee, title, and state, that's one time. One time, one done, time I now have yeah. it. There's no the way. The way I like to think about cost. that, the, the middle portion that you've got right there, the way I like to think about that is that's paying the people to do the work to get the loan done. Yeah. Right. Uh, versus the ongoing cost it, uh, of maintaining the loan that you have with the bank. Right, and let me just uh, add here, when we're dealing with first lien HELOC, in terms of, you know, what am I getting with that fourteen ninety five origination fee, right? Am I just getting a product and being left in the woods to, you know, pay off this no. debt loan? Or yeah. do I get support, right? And that's something I want you to cover real quick, is yeah. the, this is, where I see the unique value proposition with First Savings Bank, First Lien HELOC that you guys have is the support system yep. that you guys have in place. So if you can touch on that just a little bit. Yeah, absolutely. So our bank is unique in that First Savings Bank um, holds all of our loans in-house, all of them. So they don't go to anywhere a, else. Right. They don't go to a third-party bank, we don't sell it. 
And that, I think that's beneficial for a number of, of things. One has to do with the servicing. The way that our loan is serviced is uh, consistent because it's all done by the same bank. And it's also, uh, it, won't, it won't change because the loan won't be sold. Mm. And so that's one piece to it. Gotcha. But I think more than that, what we've done is, is created a, a, an environment and a specific path at our bank where every single person that, that touches your loan, who, from the person that, that built the loan at the bank, to me or, or Michael, the other loan originator who specializes in first thing HELOCs, to the processors, to the underwriter, to the dedicated closers that we have, to the people that manage the integrated checking account on the retail side of the bank, we all know what you're doing and we all know what this loan is about. And it's really kind of a unified division. It's not actually a division, but uh, it sort of feels like that where every single person that touches your loan and you have you have experience with is going to know what you're doing. And so right. um, when I call, well, we've had, when I call exactly, in right. and I have an issue, hey, oh, my God, I, I forgot to you know do this or, hey, I'm struggling yeah. to figure out if I should chunk at this or chunk at that. Like you literally everybody on the team knows what you're doing with the tool, which yep. relieves the stress that some of my clients have come to me in the past with where I guess it, it could be a bit of a fear where they're like, hey, Denzel, if I start doing velocity banking, is, is the bank going to close my line of credit? They're going to freeze me. They're going to cancel because they know what mm -hmm. I'm doing and I'm finessing like over. I'm getting one over the bank. Are they going to because they can track me and they see what I'm doing. And so imagine having a bank that's like, hey, how you doing? How's that? How's your next chunk coming along? How's your next, yep. you know, big lump yep. sum payment? Did you make it? Did you put it through? Did you run the no Like, that's pretty freaking cool. And it's great. In a way, this also can potentially remove me, the financial coach, the guru, the influencer out there that's charging high ticket sales coaching for quote unquote velocity banking. They could essentially remove a Denzel and go straight to the source and I have a bank, I've got an Anthony, I've got a Michael, I've got all these other people at the bank that can help me run numbers. And that's not gonna cost me a coaching fee, a consulting fee, right? That's true. So that's another um, very unique value proposition that I, I found that to be amazing where I'm, I'm sure people like myself would maybe not even want to promote you guys. Cause like, wait a minute, it's taking business, <laughs> well, you know? So, so, but, so here's, here's the thing though, you know, um, I think that we're, we're, I'm lucky and we're unique in that we do know the product and I feel comfortable teaching velocity banking with a first thing healer, right? I, mm -hmm. Right. That That's the truth. The reality is our business is not as coaches, right? Um, right in terms of capacity and purpose, right? We don't have ongoing support to help people continually make decisions on how to use this, right? right. Yeah, I can teach velocity banking and how it works and mm -hmm. all that. But um, don't expect a guy like me well, to exactly. be, you know, holding your yeah. hand the whole way. So it doesn't necessarily remove me, but, it, but, but when I am talking to certain clients that are very educated, because I have people that watch my channel, even people who are, are live right now that never became a client, never paid me a dollar, they watched all my videos and they, you know, DIY approach. They did it themselves, right. yep. got a ton of results. And then I would even say, okay, hey, um, you know, been doing great with that credit card, that P-lock. Are you ready to upgrade to like a first lien or a second lien HELOC? Yep. I, I recommend reaching out to these guys because you don't need me if you're financially self-sufficient in your personal finances. You're pretty disciplined. Maybe you're a higher income earner. It's nice to, you know, I have access to this bank, but again, they're not my financial advisor, financial coach. They're not going to yeah. say, yeah, do this, do that, do this. Here's how you do it. Map the whole thing out. Rather, yeah. they're just going to, you guys on the initial acquiring of the first lien HELOC, you're going to run numbers, make sure this makes sense for the right. debts that you have and the goals that you have. And then you're off to the races. And if there's any, you know, issues along the way, yeah, you're able to support. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. So, you know, I, I think that it, it works out that we, we know the product and I even spend time with every person that I talk with, no matter how well-versed or not, they come to the table. Right. 
you kind of gauge where people start with and kind of meet them with where they are. But I always make sure that we go through, you know, that is it okay if I share with you how I understand this just to make sure it lines up with your understanding too, right? And I sort of go through that just because I want to make sure, right? Um, but at the same time, our business model is providing people with loans that benefit their lives. Our business model is not about continually coaching people and helping them right. learn how to use this, right? And so, but yeah, no, absolutely. Gotcha. So with that, coming back to the uh, all-in-one loan here, another deciding factor is what they require up front. I, I believe it's like you have to have 10% in reserves, capital, I think 20% down. Uh, so I think I think they may have changed the 20% to 10%. Okay. So I think they can actually go to 9 so Probably 90%. 10% down, but then I think you still have to have like an additional 10 in reserves. Yes. So so that that's one thing that's one main difference is the reserves piece. You can go to 90%. I think they just recently switched that, but you can only put 10% down or if you're doing a refinance, you can go to 90% LTV, which we can too. But one main difference is that I, I don't know how much it is, but yeah, it, it's 10% or, or maybe more at, and don't quote me on that, but a lot of people that I end up helping, um, that have, have not gone with, with the all in one it's because of the cash reserves. Uh, Correct. They didn't have that initial capital to begin with. So looking at a first lien HELOC could be more attractive. In addition, when it comes to costs, it's not just mortgage insurance. They got the same thing because it's right. they're refinancing the right. whole entire original mortgage, replacing it with an all-in-one. So there's going to be a title state appraisal. I don't think they have an origination fee. I might be incorrect, but I do know they um, have an, I do know they have like an annual fee of like I think fifty bucks or something okay. like hundred. My understanding is that they do have an origination fee, and from what I understood, okay, it, yeah. It so they got the same stuff. Pretty much the same stuff. Yeah, pretty much. Um, uh, something else that's that's different between the two products is the the draw period um, and how that's structured. Um, they have it same ten year draw. They, they have it. Well, we've got the ten year draw with the twenty year, you know, uh, pay down. They offer a, a thirty year, yeah, right. uh, thirty yeah. year draw. Um, but the line of credit decreases, right after, after year ten. Right, uh, so that it's, it's a ten year draw, and then and then it decreases after that. What we find is, you know, after whenever people come to the end of the ten year period with with our first in HELOC, they just refinance into another first lien, another ten year draw. Is there a and cost for that? So we waive the origination fee, but the third party costs there are. Gotcha. Um, that, right, no, no getting around that. Okay. Yeah, um, that that part no, but you know, I, I sort of think about that and and how that, you know, how or why it would be beneficial or, or not. And if I think about a lot of times what people are doing by year eight, nine, 10 with their first thing HELOCs is it's, it becomes less of a debt reduction tool and more of a, a leverage tool, right? Correct. So yeah, by then doing, ideally, I want all my people to be pretty much debt free after you know, 10 years. In reality, after four to seven years, we're completely free from all consumer debts. If there are any debts remaining, it's either the mortgage itself because it's at such a low rate or possibly student loans because those things are either deferred, the payments are super small, it doesn't even make sense to try to pay those off. No, I agree. And yeah. they're in a position where they can now, like you say, leverage the capital, go invest. So, so if I think about what that means in terms of, of a, a line that decreases month over month, what that means is that, and it decreases to zero from, you know, year 10 to year 30, right? So yeah. at the end of year 30, it, it decreases to zero. What that means is you have fewer and fewer dollars to leverage as your line decreases. And so the way I like to present it, which, which does make sense to me as well, which is that if you were to refinance or re-up, which is what most people do with our first thing HELOC at that point anyway, the assumption is that your home will have increased in value, which means now you can get 90% of a higher value, giving you more to safely leverage, uh, given that that is you know, the way that you're, that you're using it. Now, I know I made a lot of assumptions, but you know, I tried to, to think rationally through it 
And whether people have a coach or whether, you know, it's really cool because as you pay down your balance, you know, $50,000 in available equity is a lot of money, but I would define that as a pretty solid cushion, right? If that's all you've got. But once you get into that 150 or, you know, 120, 150, 200,000, 250 available equity that you can borrow at 5% immediately. What it does, it allows for people's cogs to turn and think, well, what if I were to, you know, I borrow at 5%, but what if I could invest, you know, take a hundred thousand and invest in something that's going to bring in 8%, right? Double, um, it which isn't crazy down. to think, right? That's not even real as, you know, that's not even like an aggressive return on a real estate investment, you know? Correct. Um, but that being said, it allows for people to start thinking like investors because now they have capital. And so that lends itself to more people actually taking that step to start building portfolios. So at that point, you know, we're, you know, you're creating investors because you're giving them the tools that investors have, which is liquid capital to be able to use to, to build, which is amazing. That that's another piece to it. That I think is just so cool. But in terms of, you know, if you have a decreasing line, it hinders your ability to leverage. Uh, Correct. There has to be a strategy with the all in one loan after you hit the 10 year you got to refinance it into a HELOC. And I spoke with an all-in-one loan officer and they recommend that. They're like, yeah, they can go back into either a, uh, a first lien HELOC. I don't know if you, because it's a 30 year plan, you don't right. restart an all-in-one loan. That's not how it works. So they would right. have to go back to a first lien HELOC. So now that would be almost, that would be double the cost right. at that point. So that's something to think about. And then the other thing was the uh, the credit score requirement. I know with them, it's 720 or higher. Mm -hmm. And yep. I think with you guys, it's uh, you said at least 700 being the lowest. So it, or it's tiered. Uh, so uh, at seven, at a 700 or above, basically you get the, the most advantageous build out, meaning we can go to 90% loan to value got the it debt to income we can go to but like you said earlier the rate stays the same regardless of yep what you get so exactly that won't now, really matter for most of my clients perfect we can we can go to 680 right so between 680 and 700 we can still go to 90 percent loan to value but it does decrease the the max debt to income from 45 to 40 percent so basically it makes it more difficult to to qualify for the higher amount um and then we between 660 and 680 we can actually go we can still go to we can go to 80 percent loan to value so the, the ltv decreases to 80 percent and the debt to income stays at 40 percent so you know I, I mentioned we don't do risk-based pricing but we do um, account for added risk credit score by changing the loan structure and the terms that are available and so uh, we can actually go to down to 660 which is substantially different than 720 but again for, for the best and most advantageous terms um in terms of seven to value and debt to income yeah 700 or above gotcha so with that we've covered requirements eligibility the terms compared it to the all-in-one we discuss who's this not for if you're in texas maryland alaska hawaii yeah. this particular first lien heloc would not be available, but does not mean you can't get a first lien HELOC. There are banks that I know of, I think in these states that that do it. I know Hawaii for sure. I want to get into Hawaii. Alaska, but I know Maryland, pretty sure. Uh, yeah. And Texas is so, so, funny. Texas is funny. You, I'm you're, you, so you're correct. So, so in terms of what states we can't do, that specifically has to do with First Savings Bank with our particular first lien HELOC in the states that we can do them in. So yeah, I mean, the, you can get first lien HELOCs in Texas. The, what I usually advise is, you know, Texas's first lien HELOC laws are different than every other state. So you can only take a minimum draw of 4,000. Correct. You can't have a debit card. And Correct. so- What's the minimum the, draw with I, you guys, first lien HELOC? Oh, there is none. There's no minimum none. draw. That's cool. No. Um, is there an annual fee as well with the- uh... First lien. No, 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 no annual fee, no transaction fee. There's no, um, another unique value proposition there because I know every other first lien HELOC, second lien HELOC for all the people I've worked with, there is some annual fee, like 50 bucks 
I yep. think maybe upwards of a hundred. And that's consistent. That's an annual thing after the, after the, um, initial appraisal fees, titles, and then things like that. So, mm -hmm. yep. okay, cool. Um, so one, one thing to also know in comparison to the all in one is the servicing. Um, you know, the all in one, the, one of their main value props, right. Or that what they offer is, is that it, you get the checking account, right. And it manages that our first lien HELOC at first savings bank does that also, we call it diff something different. You know, we've branded it differently, but when you close with us, you also get a checking account through first savings bank. And it's the same checking account that all of our customers use, mm -hmm. uh, or all, all the retail customers use. And, you know, it's got, it comes with debit cards, checks, online bill pay, you know, um, this which is ACH, right? Which is outbound and ACA inbound. It's got a mobile app with mobile check deposit, direct deposit, everything like that. And so the, the only difference is that it's connected to your HELOC. And so it automates the transfer of funds between your checking account and your HELOC. And so when you direct deposit to this checking that night, there's an automated suite function that looks at the balance of the checking account. And when you deposit, your checking shows a positive balance that night, it automatically pushes the money into your HELOC for you automatically. So you never have to make that transfer in terms of, you know, using your HELOC to pay your bills, part of the velocity banking strategy. What you do here is um, you pay your bills with your checking account in the same way you, cho you choose to now. And it actually draws that checking balance into the negative. It overdrafts the checking. Uh, which is fine because it's the way that we designed it. And then what happens at night is when the suite function looks at the checking and sees the negative balance and pulls money from the HELOC into the checking to reimburse it back to zero, which increases your HELOC's balance, um, essentially paying for the things that you, you know, that you spent money on uh, the day before. Which is genius, so which is genius because what you're saying, um, and I'll try to illustrate this for the audience here is we've got money going in to the debt tool, the first lien HELOC, but I don't have to manually do that. So that right. eliminates one step of velocity banking. Then you have expenses that have to come out by setting up bill pay through the checking account. The bill gets paid through the checking account, but there was no money in the checking account to begin with. Why? Because all your yeah. income went into the, the debt tool. So you're getting, you're swiping your debit card throughout uh the month or yep. you have automatic bill pay yep. brings your account into the negative at 11.59 or 12.01 at night boom it the heloc itself restores that balance back to zero so literally you it is only taking exact to the penny what you need which yep. means every single pen penny down to the penny remains in that HELOC manipulating that 5%, making it much lower than an actual 5%, which is why when I first came across you guys and you, and you know, you were like, when I first connected you with you, I was like, what's the rate? And you were like 4.75, I was like, mm, dang. But then when I got to fully comprehend the whole entire, the system, the engine of it, that 5% can very easily become three can very easily become two and a half, yeah. 3.5 yeah. with something like this, right? So just to repeat for the people watching, your income automatically gets dumped into the first lien HELOC. That's one step removed. Step number two that gets removed is you having to remember to pull money from the HELOC back to the checking. Checking pays your car, pays your car insurance, your phone bill, groceries, this, da, 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 et cetera, et cetera. And then so that those steps are being processed yep. for you on a day to day to and add you, to that, and you attach the credit card, right? For yep. the cashback rewards. And that exactly. relates your rate, your effective rate even lower. So yeah. Pretty cool right yeah. there. I like that. To add to that too, to the, um, so a, a lot of people that we help are refinancing out of other first lien HELOCs, uh, that don't work like this. And so I get to hear their stories. Right. And so one, another thing that they bring up is that you know, your auto pays are set up to simplify your life, right? So you don't have to think about it. it with most first lien HELOCs, the reality is that, you know, you have to transfer money into your checking. So there's money there that you can pay for things, right? Well, if you have an auto pay set up on the 15th, 
That means you have to proactively log into your account and transfer money from your HELOC into your checking account, right? Before the auto pay hits, because if you have a regular checking account, it'll overdraft that checking. Basically what our product does is it removes the responsibility of transferring funds, which has to happen somehow, right? For this, mm -hmm. for this strategy between your checking and HELOC and your HELOC and checking for you to function on a day-to-day -day basis. It removes that responsibility from you and puts it on us and we, you know, we automate it. While at the same time, it, um, we leave you with a checking account that you work from and that you, that you uh, function through, right? Uh, that works just like your checking account does now, which means that there's no lifestyle change. There's no new process or procedure you have to learn and maybe get good yeah. at, maybe not, right? To succeed with this. Um, and we did it because our goal was to provide a product that didn't get in the way of people's success. Yeah, and sometimes things like that can speed you up when you're learning because you know i have a big audience big group of people that are learning the concept so yeah. there's, there's a delay in the learning curve then yeah. you then you get the debt tool now before you use it you got to strategize okay what am i going to do with this thing now that i have it because you can't strategize until you know what your debt weapon is right you right. can assume and do hypotheticals but until you actually get the credit limit and the rate and you get that approval within a few days or a week or so you have access to the tool so now you got to strategize within that time that creates a delay okay yeah. and then by the time you you do all the work you're you know you could be somewhat delayed and so my job is to try to shorten the learning curve number one shorten the time it takes you to get approved for your debt weapon Yep. know exactly what the rules and fundamentals are so you can run those numbers much faster that's why i'm always showing case studies yep. and then we're into action mode but now with a first lien heloc debt weapon debt tool you now are eliminating those tedious steps of money going in money coming out money going in money coming out and those of you that are watching yep. you you hear me say that all the time how critically important it is to pay right. attention yeah. Do your bills. Hey, make sure you withdraw what you need on an every three to five day basis so you don't forget. So your account doesn't overdraft because we don't like overdraft fees. Well, you're saying right. with your checking account, yes, it overdrafts, but there is no fee when that there's happens. no fee. And we actually use the overdraft protection feature that the bank already had to accomplish the backward sweep, which is what I like to call it. But yeah, again, there, there's no fee with that. So, you know, um, it does, it, it removes the necessity of taking three to five days worth of expenses and putting it in your checking just so you can function, right? Which also means that more money in real time stays in your HELOC and every dollar that's there that's maintains a huge. lower balance, saving you money and, and paying off your house faster. That is huge. A lot of people, a lot of people that's gonna fall, fly over people's heads, but for some that are in this room that know what he just said, that is, that is exactly what brings that rate from a five to a four to a three yep. to two and a half. And you're really now competing with say your competitor of an all in one loan or your second lien HELOC or a personal okay. line of credit. Most personal line of credits are, you know, upwards of six, seven to like 12%, you know, so right. that if you're someone that does have a personal unsecured revolving line of credit, at some point we absolutely want to upgrade to a first yep. lien HELOC, to a second lien HELOC, it would not hurt. So, you know, taking a, a look at this and um, when it comes to the fees, right? $3,500 on average, is that taken from the equity or I come out of pocket or do I have the option to do both? Yep. So, um, so the only thing that is paid for out of pocket regarding the closing costs or settlement fees, you know, paying the people to do the work, that I really kind of, that when I realized that's actually what it is, that's sort of how I like to present it. But the only thing that's paid for out of pocket is the appraisal because appraisers get paid before they go out and do the job. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, which I wish I could get paid before I did my job, but it doesn't always work like that. But uh, all that being said, um, that's the only thing paid for out of pocket and everything else is looped into the loan balance. So it does increase your balance. But what that does mean is that you don't have to come to the table with any cash. Exactly. Um, Versus so, you know, your all-in-one yeah. loan competitor. Right. Okay, cool.